Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's talk, The Death of Local, uh, where we're going to talk about how COVID-19 is flattening the geographic value proposition. I think more specifically, we're going to talk about how COVID is really, I'd say, accelerating the flattening of this geographic value proposition that, I, that you know, specifically to the whole payroll outsourcing industry, uh, you know, local is, uh, I think, historically been an important uh, value prop and a differentiator against competitors. Uh, but more than ever, uh, it's time to really rethink this value prop. So my name is Mike Fenoy. I'm the head of marketing at Assure, and I'm just really thrilled to be here. This is a topic that I've spoken on before uh, uh, where, where I think the we all have to look in this industry at the how we're going to evolve our value proposition uh, in, in really – you know, how COVID has just accelerated that. So uh, let me back up a step. So th this past Labor Day weekend, uh, I was uh, visiting my wife's family in Austin, Texas. Uh, this is actually a picture of my father-in-law. <clears throat> uh, he is, uh, 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 I'd say, a computer <laughs> project manager guy by day in uh, drag races cars on the weekends uh, in, in by night. This is, this is his passion. And I really don't know much about uh, the, the industry of the sport, but uh, got to talking about uh, uh, you know his hobby and talking about uh, this talk that I was going to deliver this week, and just the evolution of of you know COVID and how it's impacted really every aspect of our life. And we got to talking about racing, and I'm asking him these questions. Uh, and he talked about just a, a simple thing like uh, apparently this is called a race card. So if you see the the yellow ticket on the left hand side. So this is uh, as you before you approach the finish the the, the start line, um, <clears throat> whatever track you happen to be at, they're going to print out this ticket. It tells you where you are, tells you a little bit about who you're racing against, so you can factor all that in and do your planning. Uh, and that's just simply the way all the tracks did it, and that's the way it always was. It worked. Um, it may not have been the most technologically advanced, but it just simply worked. It just so it's, it's the way it was, right? And all of a sudden, come COVID, uh, they're doing their very best. You know, they don't have fans in the stands. Uh, they they still want to have their their races, uh, but they're doing it as touchless as possible. So most of the tracks have gone to this image on the right, and this is a screenshot from one of his races uh, that is the digital version of this race card, uh, <clears throat> where you know gives him all the same information, but now he can actually even like drill into this person he's competing against. He can drill in to see the uh, the, 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 the race times and the, in, in how he's performed, how his competitors performed in different conditions and whatnot. And it's really just kind of hard to imagine ever going back to the version on the left, right? So the, the, the point of this is to step outside of the, uh, payroll world example, just to say, Hey, th there's been this digital evolution in every aspect of our lives, right? Whether it's business or personal hobbies, whatever. Um, <clears throat> and we could see, this kind of coming on the right hand side, but this, but COVID has really been the, the gasoline on the fire, if you will, to really accelerate this movement. And I think the, the biggest thing here is this is not like a COVID thing. This is the new normal, right? And I'm not talking about pandemic being the new normal. I'm talking about the digitization of just this simple process. Can you ever imagine uh, uh, the, these guys going back to these yellow printed tickets, right? It, it, that's silly. Of course they would, right? So this is the new normal. And I think what we're going to talk about today is not just, hey, this is a specific topic that we got to think about for this next, you know, three months, six months, nine months, however long this pandemic lasts and, uh, uh, you know, uh, we, we start come, returning to normal. I, I think there is no new normal in many respects. This is going to be the new normal. So with that, let's, let's kind of back up and just talk about why, why local in the first place. <clears throat> and uh, I got a study here from uh, Yodel where they looked at the top five reasons, and I actually pulled out the top five. They looked at more. But the top five reasons why customers buy local. Number one is personalization of the service, right? Number two is trustworthiness. <clears throat> they they want to feel like they are treated fairly from that provider, from that vendor. Uh, uh, number three is quality of work. Interestingly to me is uh, customer service is number four. Uh, I, I think there's this perception and we talk to people in this industry that it's all about the customer service. <clears throat> I think maybe you, you, you can take the, the top two for sure, maybe the top three, and they really kind of fold into customer service, right? You know, having the service feel personal to you, right? And tailored to you. 
uh, a, a trustworthy, uh, fair experience. Those really, to me, I, I think speak more to customer service than just you know what the what what your experience was uh, on maybe a single email ticket or a call. Uh, where you escalated a specific issue, right? Customer service is that overall experience, and then ultimately reliability. So I'm going to come back to these five things, but but these are the reasons. So whatever reason we think that we've been running with a value prop of local, this is what the consumers are saying. This is what customers say the, uh, are the reasons that they have traditionally bought local. <clears throat> so... If we think about uh, the, the 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 payroll outsourcing business in in the in the U.S. market, so it's a 4.8 billion dollar uh, marketplace. <clears throat> this is all of the big boys, the national providers, uh, along with all the independent payroll providers and the service bureaus. Uh, so it's huge, right? You know, talking 4.8 million dollars in you know, depending on on who the who the company is, you know, retention rates are going to range anywhere from on the lower side, 80, 85% on up to 90, 95%. Uh, you know, big customers tend to have different retention rates than small customers, different industries vary, but kind of roughly everybody's in this 10% uh, churn ratio, right? So uh, customers stay with us, you know, for nine, 10 years, um, uh, that 90% retention, the in inverse of that is a 10% churn. So if you think about 10% churn, of $4.8 billion, I mean, we're talking roughly a half of a billion dollars that's up for grabs every year. <clears throat> and and I, I'm assuming this rings true for, for most folks. Sometimes uh, people are leaving, you know, maybe one of these national providers for a really good reason. Maybe, maybe there's a specific capabilities that, that, that they need that they can't get. It's not uncommon to say for, for a customer to say, hey, you know, I'm with, I'm with uh, vendor XYZ, and I'm leaving them because I had a really bad customer experience. Customer service, they keep letting me down. I, they missed expectations. And, uh, uh, you know, maybe that company has great capabilities, but maybe they just <laughs> got the short end of the stick. Maybe Murphy's Law, they, they got a few bad experiences, and so they churn. Maybe they say, hey, I need to leave them because I need software that will do XYZ features, have XYZ capabilities for me. And maybe their current vendor has those capabilities. They just don't even know it. Right. So th there's a million reasons why, wh why there's this churn, but I think it's created this, <clears throat> I, I'd say reasonableness <laughs> of us in the, in the ser payroll service bureau world to, to kind of live on this kind of soft underbelly, if you will, of this industry, because there's just so much money up for grabs. Right. I mean, it, it, so you think about uh, why people might want to leave these big companies you know, I had a bad customer experience. Hey, I can't, you know, I, I, I don't like dealing with the phone with somebody that I can't see. Uh, uh, I, I want one throat to choke. I want to look somebody in the eye and shake their hand <clears throat> and, and who, can, who can really help me. And if you think about it, the, the allure is strong, right? The, these companies have existing budget run rate. You know, this is, they're not carving out new budget to, to pay for this because they're already outsourcing it. Uh, they already have the disposition philosophically to outsource the, the, their payroll. Um, <clears throat> for whatever reason, feature functionality, customer service, whatever, temporarily at least at this moment in time, they don't like the current vendor and they're just looking for someone who cares, right? And so maybe it is incremental new capabilities that didn't exist uh, with their current platform. A lot of times it's just having somebody who simply cares. And what, what are some of the ways that we demonstrate that we care? You make eye contact, you show up every single day, you're the same person who owns this service bureau and you're the same team of experts who's been in the local market for decades. It's not the sales rep or the customer service rep who ch changes and trends over uh, every three months. So just that simple continuity and the consistency uh, creates <clears throat> a, a really positive experience for, for, uh, for, for customers, right? And so I, I think these things kind of get thrown into this bucket, if you will, of being quote unquote, local, right? Because there is that personal touch that comes with, you know, looking someone in the eye and shaking their hand, who, by the way, does a good job for you, right? Because it's not just about local. You can't just be local and then suck. You got to actually be good, right? You got to provide a, a, a good service. And so I think there's a bunch of reasons why local has worked, right? <clears throat> uh, you know, you, you've got to be competent. 
um, but yet with that personal touch. And so when I say competence, I, I think there's a threshold of good enough. You know, there is such a thing as uh, uh, you might be so good, your software might, might be so amazing, but the market isn't willing to pay for that extra, right? So there, there is this point you have to be good enough. And then it's about relationship, right? <clears throat> and by being local, you have more advantages uh, to, to demonstrate this personal touch and not just with customers and that it have those relationships, but relationships in the community, whether it's, you know, the local youth sports programs or local charities or <clears throat> local referral sources, partnering with local CPAs, banks, attorneys, chamber of commerce, uh, uh, and then ultimately being present when things do go awry, right? Because this is, you know, you, you never get the, the call from a customer saying, hey, thank you so much for making my payroll perfect today, right? People only call when there's problems. And uh, eventually, if you have a customer for eight, nine, 10, 12 years, there's going to be something that goes wrong eventually. And it's how you respond when, when that happens, right? And so because we're local, we have the opportunity to be more, be more present, whatever that looks like. In, in a lot of times it means literally a face-to-face -face meeting uh, <clears throat> and you have more opportunity to smooth things over, right? And so the inverse of this 10% churn is this 90% retention. I mean, this is an attractive business, right? Uh, to, to, to go after a half of a billion dollars that, you know, customers that have the budget, they have the run rate, they want to do some business with somebody local. Hey, look, lo and behold, you're local. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's alluring. And I'm not even suggesting it was ever the wrong approach. And in many ways, it is and will continue to be the, 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 the right approach. But things are also changing. <laughs> and, and, we, and, we, and we have to think about how those are changing. Therefore, what are we going to do is in our business model? So, <clears throat> Before we even talk about specifically COVID and its impact uh, on, on local, I think we, we have to acknowledge, whether we see it or feel it or not, that the value prop, at least from my perspective, of local has been eroding for quite a few years. Now, a lot of times that is masked, right, because we have these customers eight, nine, ten years. So we may have been a successful service bureau in the market for uh, several years now, but... Uh, um, those customers stay with us and we aren't in, in, in they love us. We've had good service. Uh, they're not leaving probably no matter what. So some of these macro trends have been happening. We just don't yet feel them in all cases. So, so that's really the, the, what I want to talk through here is if we go back to those big five reasons why people buy local in the first place, right? That's the personalized service, the trust or the delivering quality work, customer service and reliability. And let's just think about what's happening in each of those areas. So personalized service. <clears throat> now I know we're, we're, we're in the HCM space, right? Human capital management software, HR software, apparel software, time to tenants. Uh, it's operational, it's transactional, it's finance oriented, it's compliance oriented. <clears throat> so, uh, but, but beg me, uh, uh, allow me to beg an example from social media because these, these technological worlds are colliding, right? And so if I think about Facebook, <clears throat> you got 1.7 billion unique users, right? I mean, just an, 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 a mind boggling number, 300 billion, 330 million people in the United States, 1.7 billion unique users worldwide for Facebook. So massive. But the user experience is unique for every single one of those 1.7 billion people, right? And it's because of this thing with the concept of the news feed, right? So they're only seeing things that they follow. They're seeing people that they're friends with. They're uh, seeing updates from things that they've liked, <clears throat> right? So uh, the, the era of mass personalization is here. It may not be fully here in payroll HR software yet, but from a technological perspective, it is here and it is starting to train and condition uh, uh, user expectations, customer expectations. Okay, next one. Trustworthiness, treated fairly. So Apple, uh, you know, pretty widely known as one of the most respected band, brands in, in the world. Whether you love them or whether you hate them, whether you love them or hate them for what they did a few years ago where they were refused to work with the FBI to build some back door uh, <clears throat> into their products to, to you know, help find some uh, data 
uh, on the phones uh, from people who were suspected of terrorism, right? So controversial topic, but Apple went so far as to really pretty publicly, uh, Tim Cook spoke about this publicly, uh, refusing to create this back door. And whether you, again, whether you love them or hate them for what they did, they, they, they certainly cemented their public opinion that they were committed to uh, uh, data privacy. They were committed to uh, security and being trusted by their customers that no matter what, they had their back, okay? Uh, delivering quality work. <clears throat> so I, I, this one has just evolved so much. When I think about local to being national to being global. I mean, I remember a day not that long ago where you had the Microsoft Exchange server sitting in a, on, a, on, a, on a computer that sat, that sat in the closet in the office, or maybe you got a little data center in the office, depending on the size of your business. And then that kind of moved to outsourced data centers. And then that kind of outsourced moved to managed services where you had some third party managing your, your, uh, uh, your exchange server, right? <clears throat> and, uh, you know, a, a bunch of, skip a bunch of steps. And now it's all direct to Microsoft and Office 365 who has 200 million users. And guess what? The user experience is actually better. I mean, as long as you've got a high speed internet connection, now you get the same functionality you had before, but you get to more sharing of, fi uh, uh, sharing of files in collaboration. Uh, if I used a Google example, it's way more. It's, it's 2 billion users. So again, 300 million people in the United States, Office 365, 200 million users. I use this example just because we're more business oriented uh, uh, today. Uh, the, the attendees of this uh, conference and on, on today's talk, but uh, uh, you know, in, in Google, I would say the G Suite <clears throat> is maybe a little more B two C, a little more consumer based, but it's literally two billion G Suite users. So uh, clearly, just something as simple as do I use Microsoft Word and Excel and PowerPoint local on my machine versus do I collaborate through the cloud? We can use technology to deliver high quality, dare I say, higher quality work across the internet, right? So the 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 requirement of everything being local <clears throat> for technology, I'm not saying it doesn't exist at all, but it certainly is flattening and, and that's happening regardless of, of COVID. <clears throat> Customer service. Uh, again, I think there are plenty of lessons to be learned and I, I'm not going to suggest that Bank of America has arrived. I can say from my own personal experience, um, trying to uh, get into a, a bank one time and it turned out it was a video only, but clearly they're making big, big moves. They have hundreds and hundreds of uh, ATMs that are, that are video-based tellers. They have quote unquote branch locations that aren't what we think of as a, as a bank branch. They are, uh, you walk in the door, you stick your ATM card in, put your pin in, and then you walk behind a closed door or a screen pops down and you're talking to somebody somewhere else in the country, somewhere else across the globe, uh, that is the same as a personal teller. <clears throat> and so it, it, even customer service is being so flattened that it doesn't necessarily require a face-to-face -face interaction. For reliability, think about <clears throat> Amazon. I mean, you got your five nines of uptime. I mean, Amazon Web Services, AWS is, is world-class for, for uh, hosting and security. <clears throat> in, in, in all these things combined, touch us, right? And so uh, again, I'm not going to say that the payroll HR outsourcing world, the software, the, per, the services, everything is 100% here, but clearly the, the, the macro trend is, is moving this direction, right? From personalization to the trustworthiness, delivering of quality, uh, <clears throat> customer service being more virtual, certainly reliability uh, of, of technology. This is the direction everything is moving. So then that kind of begs the question, uh, uh, you know, how is COVID impacting all of this, right? And <clears throat> think about how is COVID impacting in a world where it, it might be an exaggeration to say the word everything, but kind of when everything is moving virtual, right? I mean, certainly for a short period of time, it is everything. Um, you know, many offices are just simply closed. Your customer might be across the street but that doesn't mean you can see them face to face. You can't, in many cases, go get a cup of coffee, uh, uh, get a breakfast, have a, have, a, have a lunch meeting because the restaurants you know, don't have the same capacities or in some cases even open to do so, right? So 
So, and even if you can, the social distancing rules, I mean, this, this, is, this is a very, very different world. So, so what does local mean in this COVID context? <clears throat> and, if I, and if I think about going back to why local has worked, right? It's the, it's the competence with a personal touch. It's the local relationships. It's local referrals. It's being presents, present when things go awry. All of these things are being chipped away at. So the same way we looked at the reasons why people buy local, and I'd say the macro trends over the last several years are, are kind of eroding. This is all stuff that's happened just within the last nine months, right? So, so Zoom video conferencing. I mean, they grew 350 plus percent just in the first quarter of this year, and it's all on, on, on COVID, right? So <clears throat> clearly the trend was to more... Uh, video conferencing and unified communications, but COVID has just thrown an accelerator on this thing. And guess what? There's no going back. But will will people maybe uh, try to go face to face as much as they can when they when they can again? Of course they will. <clears throat> and you're going to want those local relationships the best you can, so you're going to try. But Zoom video is not going to go away, right? This is kind of the new normal. Local relationships. I mean, think about what we're doing today. This conference alone, I mean, we, we're not face-to-face -face, uh, in the great city of Austin, right? We are, we are doing this virtually uh, over the internet. Everybody's sitting probably, maybe some people in their office, probably most people sitting in a home office of some type uh, in, in listening to me talk and deliver this presentation today. This is a, all a virtual thing. When, when, if I go to Google Trends and just you type in virtual event platform, there's, there's the line on search volume. <laughs> yeah, a, a year and two ago, there was essentially no search volume for on, on this topic. But but guess what? Because you can't have these local uh, relationships, people are trying to do their events personally. And maybe it's not just a big events like this where where you know traditionally been a, gr a great networking event. It, it's local too, right? It's the local chamber of commerce. <clears throat> it's it's the the local community. Uh, uh, you know, first of the month men's uh, pancake breakfast, right? Where the, uh, some local community charity. Um, it, it's it's uh, local clubs and communities. It's the local high schools uh, in, in youth sports. That those opportunities just aren't there, and it's evident by the what by the tools people are using and how they're searching for those tools. <clears throat> local referrals. I think. I think. Uh, referrals uh, are kind of going on steroids here, but it's in the digital way. So nine out of 10 consumers, they're reading Google reviews before they purchase. And so uh, there's lots of platforms. There's, you know, there's G2, uh, there's Google, there's Facebook. Um, <clears throat> and, you, and you can and should be trying to, to rank high on, on all those. But more than ever, the, we're seeing an acceleration of these uh, platforms. And the thing is, once it's on a platform, it might start out local, right? But once your business is ranking with high reviews, it doesn't matter where that customer, where that prospect is uh, to, to then see that review. And then being present, what, what does pre being present look like if it's, you know, on a Zoom call, if it's on a conference call, if you can't be there face to face, you may be as present as you possibly can, and you might be super competent. You might be have, have an amazing friendship and relationship with these people, but you no longer have the competitive, without the things above, you no longer have the competitive advantage of being present compared to, say, a large national player who, it, who isn't in the, in the backyard uh, uh, beyond just your knowledge of maybe local events, local sports, uh, youth programs, et, et cetera. Uh, and so being local may still have some advantages into the context of your conversations, but if you're not physically together, uh, it, it, that, that advantage is, is wildly flattened compared to uh, what it was, I'd say, just even, you know, nine, ten months ago, pre-pandemic. Okay, so step back for a second out, out of COVID. If we think about uh, just this digital acceleration, right? So there, you guys may have seen a chart like this before um, <clears throat> and, and how long it takes to reach 50 million users. Uh, it, and so it took the telephone, a technological uh, marvel in, uh, in its own right, for sure. It took the telephone 75 years to reach 50 million users. 
uh, it took the radio 38 years uh, to reach 50 million users. TV, it took 13, right? It took the internet just four years. So uh, uh, then once, the, once the, we hit the internet, things started to really accelerate, right? Facebook, uh, many people probably can't imagine a world without Facebook. It's not that old. It only took three and a half years to reach 50 million uh, uh, viewers. Uh, Facebook buys Instagram. Instagram only took 18 months. In a year and a half, they uh, reached 50 million users. And maybe a silly example, but I think it holds the record. And it's even a couple years old now. Uh, Pokemon Go. <laughs> Pokemon Go <clears throat> reached 50 million users in just 19 days. So wh what is it that these things have in common? Why should we care in the context of, of this conversation? Well, what are the commonalities that really drive adoption in, in, in the context of acceleration, right? Of acceleration of adoption of being digital. Well, first and foremost, there's a mobile component, right? So uh, why, was, uh, why was Facebook, Instagram, Pokemon Go uh, uh, able to accelerate so much? You know, it was to the electronical, electronic device that's kind of tethered to us at all times. It's our mobile phones, right? And so prior to that, you had to wait for someone to be in front of a radio, in front of a TV, near a, a wired phone. But now that we are permanently tethered to our phones, uh, that would be one requirement. Another one would be web, right? And so native to being a, a, a mobile phone, you got to have a mobile app, uh, mobile friendly apps or websites, <clears throat> responsive websites, uh, so that you can access the information at all times. And these things are personal. Right, so Facebook, we talked about the news feed is unique to every single person. Uh, Instagram, uh, uh, it's depending on who you're friends with and who you follow, and, and it's uh, driving personal engagement for your own content that you publish. Po Pokemon Go, literally using the, if you don't know what it, what it is, uh, it's based on exactly where you're at and using your camera in, 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 in uh, uh, playing the game based on what you literally see in front of you. And then the last thing is secure, right? So as we think about the evolution of the, this whole payroll HR space, we're kind of getting there, right? I mean, pretty much all the apps can be accessed mobily. Certainly they're all SaaS based and, and web based. I think uh, all the vendors are we're, we're getting better and better all the time at personalization. Uh, even, if, even if the platforms aren't, the, the providers, the service bureaus certainly can. And as everything moves to the SaaS world, uh, in an AWS world, the, we're just getting better and better at security all the time. So depending where you are and your adoption in this continuum, you know, there's this quote from CNBC, it was actually published on CNBC, it was from BDO, that you know, businesses that have not only developed digital strategies but executed them prior to the pandemic, they're now in a position to leapfrog their less nimble competitors. And so if that's you, awesome. <clears throat> if that's not you, it kind of begs the question, uh, what are you going to do to go from here, right? Because the, the, the reality is there's still this big marketplace. There's this 10% churn that there's still lots of money to be made uh, for probably quite a while yet uh, with a, a value prop based on local. But don't think about this as you competing against, you know, big blue, big red, a uh, handful of other competitors who all have this either national versus local strategy. Your competitors are on the phone right now. They're on this conference, right? If you've previously competed against each other, or I'd say maybe not competed against each other because of geography, uh, geography, you know, excluded you from each comp competition. But as, <clears throat> as more and more people think about not using geography and using these things to change their go-to-market strategy, everybody in this phone uh, is in a race to, to get there. It, it, and let's talk more specifically about what, what I mean by that. So uh, forgive me if, I, you know, if I'm missing some, I just kind of threw the big names up here. So, you know, if, if I think about you in the center, where, where do you sit in this continuum, <clears throat> uh, you know, you, you've got all the major players, uh, you got some uh, really big companies, plenty of, you know, multi-billion dollar companies here. You got some smaller companies uh, with a lot of juice and a lot of name recognition. 
uh, uh, most uh, what we see here is small and mid-sized businesses, right? And so if you think about a logo tied to uh, tied to a value proposition, so this is just clearly stuff right off of these companies' websites. Uh, uh, <clears throat> what, we, what we did is we kind of laid these out and said, okay, how do, how do we organize these? Are we competing against all these people in exactly the same way? Are you competing against all these people in the same way? And if you think about it, I think you can put them all in this continuum. So if you think the see the dotted line in the on the bottom, this left to right continuum, I think I think this really kind of falls uh, where some vendors, uh, you know, focus in their messaging more about the product and the technology. And then on the left, on the far right hand side, you got vendors that are talking more and more about outcomes in in people, right? <clears throat> and you know, I think said another way, these are it's the feature benefit. Continuum. So you think about selling, you think about marketing. I talk about my features and why my features are better and why I have more of them that are better. I think about the benefits. I think about uh, the, you know, the service that I provide and what are the outcomes and why the outcomes are better doing business with me versus my competitors. <clears throat> and then I think about, okay, so where am I in this mix? If I can, if I, if I'm kind of, if I'm just a name in the crowd and then I see this continuum that they're all sitting on, how am I going to stand out from these guys? Right. Am I going to, am I going to play the same game uh, and this in playing this features benefit continuum, if you will. Um, and try to really, uh, you know, stand out in the crowd against, you know, uh, you know multi-billion dollar companies. Uh, if I'm if I'm in a local market, probably not. But I think we just got done. You know, we just spent the last you know half hour or so talking about why local is is flattening and in in in, in 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 kind of evaporating, if you will, as value prop. So, what is it that I'm going to do to stand out in in this continuum? And so, one of the things that we we're thinking about is that if, 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 if you look at the, this industry, right, what, what's, what's attractive about this whole payroll HR industry? Well, it's, it's a SaaS-based product, so it generally has pretty good profit margins. Um, it's a gigantic marketplace, right? Everybody needs it. Um, <clears throat> there, there's, no, there's no niche. We're not, we're not selling uh, wedding dresses, right, where we're where we are immediately uh, market is fractured into uh, one gender and catching those women at a very specific moment in time in their life when they coincidentally in the market for a wedding dress. We're not a niche market. Every business in the United States and the world needs payroll, right? So uh, it's a gigantic market. And I think that therein maybe lies our opportunity because the, I would contend that these national players software companies the reason they're all on this same feature benefit continuum and, and here you can see we turn that x axis on the previous slide where it's features versus benefits and they're all in the same continuum and we turn it on its side <clears throat> in 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 same continuum features versus benefits but now the that's the y axis and the x axis is the the marketplace and I think part of the reason that they're playing in the same continuum is because they're going, they're all going after the big market, right? They're all going after everybody. They're going after every single small, medium sized business that exists. And if you try to play that game, <clears throat> if you're less than, you know, say a hundred million dollars in revenue or have some really deep pockets uh, to, to, to go big, then it's really hard to stand out in that, in that crowd. Right? So what do you do when the value prop of local, is evaporating and but standing out in the feature benefit continuation continuum is really really hard well I, I think it calls for specialization right so so maybe it's a, a vertical market maybe it's an affinity group maybe it's an association maybe it's a tech stack and, and maybe maybe some of these things are intertwined and so what I would leave you with is this is as we think about how technology was already flattening the value proposition of being local and how COVID has accelerated that. Let's take this opportunity to, to look at our existing customer base. We don't have to probably reinvent our entire businesses. I mean, our, our customers stay with us eight, nine, 10, 12 years, right? It's a, it's a good business. 
and we have repetitive revenue. So we have, dare I say, we have some time to think about this and how we pivot and how we grow into our long-term strategy. But I think it's, it's, I think it's death to think our permanent strategy is always going to be local because the reality is the, the products will continue to get better. You know, I have in my, my left hand here, my, my iPhone, I, I don't care that it's, you know, engineered in Cupertino, California, right? I don't, I don't know, even know where I would go to get customer support because I don't need it. The thing just simply works. I bought it from, from the, the store, uh, from my, from my uh, carrier <clears throat> and I turned the thing on and with my thumb, I can kind of click around and I just figured out it's intuitive and, and, and stuff just simply works. So I don't need to go to customer support. Therefore, I don't need one throat to choke. I don't need somebody to make eye contact with me to, and shake my hand to promise me my phone is going to work. And my promise to you guys is, is all these guys in the left make their products better and better and better. Those, their customers are not going to need somebody local to make eye contact and shake their hand either because the stuff, stuff simply is going to work. So we're going to have to have a new value proposition other than, hey, we're the local alternative. Uh, we're competent, we're good enough, and we're good people. You can trust us, and we're going to treat you right, and we're going to treat you fairly, and we're going to do a good job for you because those customers may not be available in the first place, right? So think about, think about verticalization and tech stack, for example. <clears throat> there are somewhere near 250,000 hair salons. In the, in the United States. And in those hair salons, there are uh, primarily two, there's, there's three or four, but primarily two software providers. They really are the ERP systems for hair salons. They do all the scheduling, they do the point of sale, they do the inventory, uh, <clears throat> uh, and, and really act as that back office. What if you decided to be the very best payroll company on the planet for hair salons? And your website and your sales collateral reflected it, your PowerPoint decks and your talk tracks. Uh, <clears throat> you spoke hair salon, <laughs> you spoke to, to the owners, and you built some custom integration into uh, one or two of those top uh, uh, ERP vendors <clears throat> so that you had a real competitive advantage against every other payroll company that was trying to sell the hair salons. Maybe you look at your customer base <clears throat> and uh, you have a, a, a predominance of not just restaurants, but maybe specifically franchisees, right? Maybe you've got a bunch of franchise uh, uh, owners with, you know, anywhere from one to 10 or 40 uh, different, uh, uh, you know, Kentucky Fried Chickens or Hardee's or McDonald's, whatever the case may be, Taco Bell's. And you decide, hey, I'm going to not only develop the very best talk track around being the best payroll company on the planet for franchise owners, I'm going to actually build some, some, some tech, right? And integrate into those systems to create a real competitive advantage. I'm going to start speaking and become a, a, a member of the local associations, not, not just local, excuse me, the trade associations. Uh, uh, and I'm going to start speaking at those events. So my marketing is tied in. I'm going to be joining all the affinity groups, uh, whether it's a LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever the case may be. So vertical, affinity, associations, tech stack, it's all tied in together. So maybe today I am uh, the, the very best payroll company in uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, right? Pick a, lo pick a local market. And yeah, there's the, the, the national players could sell to there and they may be just fine. Um, but I'm the best, at least alternative to those guys. That local strategy is probably born, born fruit for many, many years. And candidly, it will probably continue to bear fruit. But the only way you're going to grow for the long term <clears throat> is we have to acknowledge that the world is flattening. Technology is flattening the geographic-based value proposition. And COVID has just thrown gasoline on that acceleration. <clears throat> right. And so my hope for you guys is that uh, certainly we, we stay healthy and we survive. Uh, our businesses survive these challenging times uh, during this pandemic. But let's use this as a time of reflection <clears throat> and think about where do I have concentration in industries in certain specific types of customers 
where can I start leveraging that, doubling down on technology, doubling down on messaging in industry vocabulary and associations and marketing <clears throat> and become the best payroll provider in niches, you know, as specific industry, one, one or two or three or four industries <clears throat> in stand out where you don't, you, know, you don't have to uh, compete only for the local business, but you can really expand your business and carve out a unique uh, piece of market share for yourself. And with that, I just want to thank everybody for your time today and wish everybody much success. Thank you so much.